So, Dr. Yustep. So I very much appreciate you guys sticking with us. We have three talks. We're in the stretch. Um, I promise we'll be near the 11.45 mark in the end. And um, let me just ensure I understand this. So really my intent here is to provide an update on defining who may benefit from an LVAD and put it in context as it relates to the strategy, bridge the transplant, whom may not be a good candidate for bridge destination therapy, I'd like to highlight the observed benefits and importantly address adverse outcomes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about transitioning in the use of LVADs in patients that are less sick. And so like many institutions to do this type of work, to evaluate a patient, incorporate their caregiver, really requires a team of cardiologists, surgeons, care coordinators, social work. And, and the reason being is it's, um, it's critical. It's critical to be clear about whether the patient has end-stage disease, yes or no, because of the poor prognosis associated with that, uh, uh, um, with that diagnosis. And then importantly, to tailor the recommendation to the patient in terms of weighing benefits and risks. And so while we do this commonly, uh, you know, several times a week and up to about 250 patients a day, we try to keep it simple as it relates to, okay, does the patient need us to take the next step? Do they have refractory end-stage heart failure to where we need to talk about transplant or LVAD or palliative care? And what I tell our, our, our medical students, residents, and fellows is that no one symptom or sign equals end-stage heart failure. It's really if the patient, in terms of how they feel, the refractoriness to guideline-directed therapy, which we've been over, they have concomitant signs that are poor prognosticators, not tolerating their blood pressure, poor functional capacity, in and out of the hospital, for example, is a red flag more than more than three or four times in the past 12 months. So if everything's pointed in the wrong direction in the context of likelihood to be alive in the next several months, we're very worried um, about, about end-stage heart failure. No one has a crystal ball and say, okay, well, you have six months to live. On top of this, certainly etiology um, is, is key. But for those patients whom um, we define end-stage heart failure, or say we think, we think our patient's unfortunately there, it's either heart transplant, LVAD, or palliative care. Now, heart transplantation, we highlighted the emergencies, still remains the most effective long-term treatment for end-stage heart failure in that we've been performing this intervention as a community you know, for 30-plus for years and with um, good immunosuppression therapy, good surveillance, one-year survival rates um, now around 90% when you look at the scientific registry for transplant recipients, with 10-year survival, 55%. Um, uh, and the unfortunate reality, though, is especially depending upon where you live, there's a limited donor supply. And patients can get sick and become sicker to where their transplant candidacy becomes compromised. So this is where device therapy really has, has come into play. Um, while there are no, I guess, uniform, specific, uh, you know, relative, absolute contraindications that can be applied across centers, I've listed here ours. Um, certainly age uh, is a concern. Patients over the age of 70, certainly with comorbidities, are a concern for poor transplant uh, um, survivorship or, or having challenges. Malignancy, most programs mandate being cancer-free for five, five years. Certainly renal cell cancer, prostate cancer, perhaps a little bit more forgiving. You can um, um, tailor that to the individual patient. At our institution, a, a body mass index greater than 35 is associated with post-transplant outcomes, so we have that as a cutoff. And some patients with progressive heart failure remodel their pulmonary vasculature to, to a degree where they have high pulmonary pressures that preclude transplant pulmonary vascular resistance, for example, greater than four Woods units, um, to where you put in a new heart, the right side's at risk for, for RV failure. And then we're having to talk about ECMO and graft failure, and, and that's, that's a real challenge. And certainly those patients with shock and multi-organ failure, no program's going to take them directly to transplant. Um, so... So we use short-term device to, to help us make decisions, but permanent LVADs have, uh, have, have helped us tremendously. In the context of a bridge to a decision, um, and we've gone away from that nomenclature, we're really trying to commit, is this patient bridge to transplant, meaning that we think they're a good candidate, we're just worried about them getting worse uh, and, and potentially dying on the list, where the intent is to list them early postoperatively, let them accrue time and commit to transplant, versus destination therapy. They may have relative contraindications or factors that may we, we may be able to improve upon um, to get them to transplant, but we'll label them as 
ex destination therapy, extended support. Some patients have absolute contraindications, for example, advanced age and comorbidities, where we're very clear and say this is de uh, therapy uh, here, here, here and after. And really, this is where the field does is exploded, and it's really been increasing destination therapy. There are now over 150 activated hospitals that are implanting devices. The landmark trials, we're not going to go over the details. Um, bridge to transplant the HeartMate 2 in 2008, two, two years later, um, um, the destination th uh, therapy trial. In 2012, the HVAD approved for, for a bridge to transplant and ongoing research in terms of new, new devices. And so the only two approved devices right now, HeartMate 2, bridge to transplant or destination therapy, or the HVAD um, for, for bridge to transplant. And as the technology has improved, management patterns really have improved, patient selection improving. When you look at Intermatch, which is the, uh, until recently, a mandated registry where implanting centers put forth all their data so we can look at um, how how we're doing from a community, big picture. Current one-year survival post LVAD at 81%, um, which, is, which is very good. What's been very reassuring, our historical um, weightless mortality rates were, were in around 12 to 13%. And when you look at these newer continuous flow pumps and weightless mortality, and this is from the Utah group headed by uh, Joseph Stelic, what we observe is that the survivorship on a continuous flow pump is equivalent to that of someone's status two transplant. Um, and so these patients are doing well. We're actually, as a community, um, in the process of uh, redefining the heart allocation score because patients on LVADs are doing, doing fairly well. Certainly patients that, that develop complications, that's a different cohort with a different uh, projectile in terms of how well they're going to do the long term. Um, but the concept is, is that LVADs have helped us curb weightless mortality, and for those patients that are in, that are that you you commit to with with, with uh, identification of uh, of candidacy, commit to bridge transplant post transplant post uh, LVAD outcome in this particular court is very good, ranging anywhere between 84 to as high as 91 percent. And this has been demonstrated in in post approval studies. It's been demonstrated in Intermax, again our large uh, national registry where 88% alive at one year in the context of uh, being alive or transplanted or whom have recovery. So destination therapy, really it's just been within the last 12 to 18 months where we're now performing more LVADs under the umbrella of destination therapy um, compared to, uh, compared to uh, the number of transplants, so more than 50%. 50 per, 50%. And survivorship has been, has been excellent. Um, now, certainly these patients have more comorbidities, so survivor rates at about between 75 and uh, 81, um, 81%. And what's, what's um, very reassuring is that um, these patients not only are, are living longer, but they have a significant improvement in their quality of life. And this is, can be looked at objectively in using these, um, these visual analog scales. And so I think for the right patient, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. I want to conclude my talk just by focusing in on some adverse events. While there's a hint that adverse events are on the downward trend, we're still challenged with infection, one in four patients, bleeding, GI bleeding, as high as maybe 25 to up to 30 percent, device malfunction in about 5 to 10 percent at one year, and stroke, 5 percent prevalence, ischemic, 5 percent uh, uh, hemorrhagic. So the event-free survival at one year is not where we want it. So really this is where the field's um, moving in terms of improved technology, improved patient management, so that we can carefully uh, um, um, weigh that benefit risk assessment with our patients. So this became, this devices were studied, examined in patients that were the sickest, those in shock, refractory to onotropes. What we've learned is that certainly you can help that individual patient. Those patients that have high grade symptoms, um, the stigmata for end-stage heart failure, but are non onotrope these patients tend to have a better post-operative course in survivorship compared to those that are more sick. In fact, one of the take-home messages, and I'll, I'll, I'll end here, um, contraindications for LVAT at our institution, like many other institutions, those with severe hemodynamic instability, uh, unclear uh, neurologic status, acute renal failure, we'll use short-term device um, um, to try to optimize their candidacy. And, and patients with, uh, for example, um, cirrhosis, we won't commit uh, to, to permanent LVAD. Um, while one may argue the benefit for that particular patient, 
um, most of the times these patients with these characteristics may not, may not do well. And so I'm going to end there in terms of device therapy and ask Dr. Ash to, to, to talk about pulmonary hypertension and RV failure. And then the remaining talk will be um, about infiltrative cardiomyopathies. And then there's lunch. Okay, I appreciate you guys hanging in there.